Thanks for watching this week's sermon from Community Church. As a reminder, like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can always contribute to what we're doing at cefchurch.com slash give. Father, here we are. And Father, I trust that we all are your children. Scripture is clear that humanity was made in your image. But yet only those who make a conscious choice become the children of God. Only those who cry out to Jesus for forgiveness of their sins become your children, your family. And so, Lord, that's my prayer this morning, that we are all belong to you. So, Lord, I ask right now for those that are standing to our right, those that are standing to our left, Father, those in front of us and those behind us, God, I don't know what their weeks have been like, but God, if they have been struggling this week, would you meet them where they are at? Father, if they find themselves in the valley, Lord, would you touch them? Would you encourage them? Would you embrace them? Father, if their week has been going well, would you continue to bless them? Father, we thank you for this amazing plan that allows people like us, broken, sinful, wicked, Father, people of our own devices, you made this amazing way for us to escape condemnation through your son Jesus and his death on the cross and resurrection. Father, too, we pray for each church in our community. Father, would you bless my pastor friends as they preach? Father, would you bless every congregation, Lord? Remind us that we stand together. This is kingdom work. It's not church work. It's kingdom work. And Father, together we are your kingdom. And we pray that your kingdom, God, would be expanded through our efforts as we love our neighbor and as we love you. God, again, thank you for our time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Oh, you sat down. We were praying. Didn't I say stand up? Thanks, Wendy, for standing up. I appreciate that. You guys follow Wendy's example. Just teasing. So anyway, welcome. Glad you're here. Who knew that when Randy leads songs, when he leads us in worship, who knew that he was just that funny? Right? I mean, he's got this sense of humor. We get to see it in staff meeting. You know, he's kind of quiet, got that little introverted edge to him. But he says some funny stuff, don't he? Anyway, I hope he, he shamed you into reading the bulletin. So anyway, well, we need to get going uh, before we start today. We are doing a, a, a small group emphasis through, through beginning in October, and we're using a, a curriculum called Love Does, and Bob Goth is the author of that curriculum. And this is in your bulletin this morning. I've been talking about it every week. So if you want to be in a small group, you want to facilitate one, you want to open your home up to one, you just want, we're just asking you to be in a small group for six weeks. And we're going to be studying this curriculum called Love Does. If you haven't filled one of these out yet, please do it right now. You can hand it to Pastor Steve at the door. You can hand it to me at the door. But who knew that Bob Goff, the author of Love Does, is a personal friend of Randy. Randy, he, he just continues to amaze us, doesn't he? He's got big name friends. And, you know, he, he, I thought I was the biggest celebrity Randy knew. But anyway, I guess I'm not. So anyway, let's jump in. We've got 72 verses to look at today, and so we need to move along. So by way of review, we're two chapters away from finishing Matthew's story. We're almost to the end. We've, we've looked at uh, 26 chapters after today, two more to go. And a couple of weeks ago, we saw in chapter 24, Jesus is talking about how things are going to be in the end. And we know that they're going to be horrendous. We know that things are going to be awful the closer we get to Jesus coming back. And so last week in chapter 25, the summer interns preached on a couple of the parables in chapter 25 about Jesus telling us what to do until he returns. And the first thing that he tells us to do in the parable of the ten virgins 
is to be fully prepared when Jesus comes. Not sort of be prepared, not kind of be prepared, because there was ten virgins and they all had their lamps ready to go. But only five of those virgins had extra oil. Only five of them were fully prepared. So we just can't be prepared a little bit for when Jesus returns. We have to fully embrace our faith, fully engage our faith, and be looking for his return to be prepared people. And then the second parable we looked at was the gifts of the talents. The faithful steward. The landowner went away for some period of time. He gave one of his servants ten. He gave one of his servants five. He gave one of his servants two. Said, I entrust these things to you until I return. That is a picture, a metaphor, of Jesus giving us gifts and talents to use until he returns. So be prepared and be busy for the kingdom until Jesus comes back. And then lastly, we saw Jesus at the great um, judgment he separated the sheep from the goats. Now, obviously, the sheep follow the shepherd, right? And Jesus is the great shepherd. And so what Jesus is teaching us there in that, in that metaphor of the judgment is that his followers, we serve others with great love. The disenfranchised, the broken, the naked, the helpless, that's what we do until he comes. We don't sit around trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. Because he's given us things to do. And so that's what we looked at last week. Now today as we enter into chapter 26, um, there's going to be some tragic turns for Jesus. This is the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly life. This is the chapter where it all really begins to go sideways. But in spite of those tragic turns, remember this. Jesus knows every step of this path. And God his Father is completely in control. So this morning, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. Anybody need a Bible, raise your hand. If you don't own a Bible, you keep this. You read it during the week. You bring it back next week. Once you get a Bible, turn to Matthew 26. And we're going to begin by talking about secret negotiations. Secret negotiation. Things that go on behind the scenes. Well, this first part, as we look at verse 1 of chapter 26, this one isn't so secret. It says, when Jesus finished saying all these things, chapter 24, Jesus talked about the end times. Chapter 25, where Jesus told us to be prepared for his second coming. When Jesus finished talking about the end times in these parables, he said to his disciples, as you know, Passover begins in two days. Passover began on that Thursday at sunset. So this is probably Tuesday and they're getting close to the Passover. And so Jesus says, the Passover begins in two days and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Now this is the fourth time Jesus has told the disciples about his impending death. Four times he said, my death is coming soon. I will die. And so this is the first time, however, that Jesus tells us he'll be crucified. So something has changed because we're getting ever closer to this chain of events beginning. And so here on this particular day, Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to be handed over and I'm going to be crucified. Now, it, look at verse, uh, the next part of that verse. At that same time, at the very same time Jesus is telling his disciples he's going to be handed over to the religious leaders and crucified, at that same time, the leading priests and elders were meeting at the residence of Caiaphas the high priest. There's no other higher authority in the, religi in the Jew Jewish religion than the high priest. The leading priests and elders were meeting at the residence of Caiaphas, the high priest. Look at verse 4. They were plotting how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. I hope none of you are having meetings at your house this week. Right? So, I, I hope none of you are having meetings of how to secretly capture Pastor Rick and kill him. But this is what the Jews do in their spare time. They sit around trying to figure out how can we capture Jesus secretly and kill him. This is amazing. At the very same time Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm going to be crucified. And then verse 5, look at this. 
but we don't want to do it during the Passover celebration or the people might riot. Now remember, Passover is just two days away. So there's literally hundreds of thousands pilgrims that have come into Jerusalem for the Passover. So Jesus is a popular guy. Jesus got a pretty big following. So you don't want to go out there in the midst of everybody and like arrest Jesus. You want to do it secretly and privately. So what we see in this very beginning verses here is Jesus symbolically connects his death with the Passover. The Passover is in two days, and I'm going to be crucified. So he's connecting to the Passover for a particular reason. Because typically at the Passover, not typically, but always at the Passover, there was a lamb that was sacrificed. And what Jesus is hinting towards, a lamb will be sacrificed this time, but it will be the lamb of God but they don't know that just yet. So, and we see another thing. His enemies are determined, but they're cautious. His enemies are determined, but cautious. So now things kind of, kind of shift gears a little bit, and we see this amazing act of love. So during this week, we read that Jesus was in Bethany. Bethany is very close to Jerusalem, less than two miles. You come out down out of Jerusalem, you go up the Mount of Olives, and right kind of on the ridge there, on the crest of the mount, is the little, ta- the little village of Bethany. And so uh, Jesus is spending some time there that week. Look at verse 6. Meanwhile... During the course of this week, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who previously had uh, leprosy. A man who previously had leprosy. Now understand this. In the first century, if you had leprosy, that was a death sentence. In the first century, you in the first century there was nobody that formerly had leprosy. Unless you had bumped into Jesus. So what do we know about Simon? Dude had bumped into Jesus. He didn't go to the leprosy centers of America and get cured or healed. He bumped into Jesus. So Jesus is at the leper, the former leper's house. Verse 7, And while they were eating dinner at Simon's house, a man who formerly had leprosy, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of extensive perfume. I love the phrasing because the description tells us that this was precious. A beautiful alabaster jar, not a clay pot. A beautiful alabaster jar. Now the thing about these kinds of perfumes and stuff in the first century, they didn't have a cork in the top, you know, like that cheap Boone's Farm wine that you just pull off. Frank told me about that. The beautiful alabaster jar was, it was a glass and it was sealed. So in order to use the perfume, you had to bust, you had to break the alabaster top. So this expensive perfume is poured over Jesus' head. When he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and she poured it over Jesus' head head. Now the Gospel of John gives us more details of the story. In verse 8 tells us that the disciples were indignant when they saw this. They got angry and they yelled out, what a waste! This woman could have sold this perfume. This is how expensive it was. A whole year's worth of wages. Now I bought my wife some pretty nice gifts along the way, but not one time has she got something worth a whole year's worth of wages. If she did, it was on credit. And she's still helping to pay that off, her (laughs) gift. But it, 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 it was precious and it was costly. And she understood something about what Jesus had been saying. Four times Jesus said he was going to die. And the disciples glossed over it. But not this woman. And The disciples were indignant. In fact, again, the Gospel of John tells us that Judas had the biggest problem with this. And then look what Jesus says in verse 11, or or, uh, verse 10. He says, but why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? 
You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus is not slandering the poor. He's simply making a statement of fact. There was poor people in the first century. There's poor people in the 21st century. Poor people are always with it. So Jesus isn't slandering the people. What he's doing is making a point about what, about what she was doing. You won't always have me with you. So to show Jesus' love in a tangible way, to worship Jesus in a tangible way, to show Jesus how great your love is for him, they were running out of time to do that, right? He, he was in the last week of his earthly life. He says, verse 12, She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for my burial. Verse 13, I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. You see, for Mary, this was costly. This was risky. But it did not detour Mary. When you love, you love lavishly. Amen? Because love is a verb. Love is what we do. To say I love you means very little. To show you my love means so much more. So for Judas, this was too much to bear. For Judas, this proved to him that Jesus was not who he wanted Jesus to be. Jesus was not following the script that Judas had in his mind for Jesus. So, what happens next in verse 14? Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest. He went to those very people that were plotting Jesus' death, that were plotting how to secretly arrest him and kill him. He went to those people and he said, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. Now, you know the ironic thing about 30 pieces of silver in the Old Testament, if you go back to the book of Exodus, to buy a slave out of slavery, you know how much it costs? 30 pieces of silver. So if you wanted to buy a person out of their slavery, it was 30 pieces of silver. So Judas went to those people and he said, I will give you Jesus. Verse 16 from that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. So as I contemplated that this week, what changed in Judas' heart? Was he ever with them? He's called a disciple. Twice in this chapter, Judas is called a disciple. Was he truly a disciple? Well, it says he was a disciple. Was he deceitful? Was he a false disciple? Was he ever really fully in? What changed in his mind? What changed in his heart? What happens to people who are pursuing the things of the kingdom and then all of a sudden they stop pursuing things of the kingdom? What happens to those people? Because that just doesn't happen in the first century. To Judas, that happens in our church. That happens in every church in this community. What are we thinking? What transpires? I don't know what that is. But something happened to Judas. Maybe Jesus let this woman pour oil on him. Maybe it was the cost of the perfume. Or maybe Jesus just got, ang or Judas just got angry at Jesus. We don't know. So from that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, if you follow in that chapter, the next thing they do is, is go up to the, to the uh, upper room and they celebrate communion there, but we'll come back to that at the end. So they've gone up to the upper room. They celebrated communion. Jesus has washed their feet. Uh, Judas has been identified as the betrayer, and he's, been, and he's left of his own accord. Jesus and the disciples come out of the upper room, and now they are heading to Gethsemane. They are heading there. Uh, they're walking on their way to Gethsemane. And so as they were walking, verse 31 tells us, on the way to the garden, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That comes out of Zechariah. He says, Tonight all of you will, 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 will desert me. You'll be scattered. 
God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, he's told him he's going to die. Now he tells him, after I've been raised from the dead, and you see there's great hope here. It's one thing when somebody tells you they're going to die. That's kind of depressing. But when somebody says, I'm going to die, and then when I'm raised from the dead, you go, oh, okay, well, then, then your death's no big deal, right? <laughs> okay, you're going to be right. So, so he says, after I've been raised from the dead, I'll meet you in Galilee. I'll meet you in Galilee. So I'm going to die on Friday, but next Thursday I'll meet you in Galilee. Okay, Jesus, sure, you bet, I'll be there. Verse 33, and Peter declared, Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will not desert you. Okay, Peter, thank you for that. Verse 34, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, before this night is over and the rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Peter says, oh, no, 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 that's not true at all. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all of the other disciples vowed the same thing. Well, you don't want to let Peter to get the jump on you, right? So Peter already beat him to the punch, so they all, yeah, that's it, me too, Jesus, yeah, hey. We'll follow you to the death. You see, Peter did not live up to his words. The other disciples did not live up to their words. And you know what? We don't live up to our words either, do we? We must never underestimate our own ability to desert Jesus. Because we do that. It happens. There's moments of weakness. There's moments of failure. There's moments that we falter. There's times for our faith to be strong and it's weak. There's times for our words to be bold and there's not. There's time for our character to make a stand and we don't do that. We must never underestimate our ability. He, he, we, we can't point a finger at Peter. We can't point a finger at the other disciples. All we have to do is follow each other around for a week, right? And we understand this, the failure to follow. Then, verse 36, this, Jesus said, you'll fall away from me as they were walking to the garden. So they finally get to the garden of Gethsemane in verse 36. And Jesus says, sit here with me while I go over there to pray. Jesus knows what's coming. He knows that in less than 12 hours, his lifeless body will be hanging on the cross, beaten and bloodied and bruised and battered. He says, sit here while I go over there to pray. And then he took Peter and James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. The humanity of Jesus is coming out now in full force. In theology, we have this word called a hypostatic union. And a hypostatic union is the union of Jesus' divinity and the union of Jesus' humanity into this one fleshly body. So Jesus is as human as you and I. He hungered, he thirsted, he sweat, he went to the bathroom. But yet, the same Jesus that was just as human as you and I, he could walk on water, he could still the storm, and he could know what people were thinking. The divine aspect of Jesus in the flesh, the human aspect of Jesus in the flesh. He says... I'm anguished and distressed. I want you to see the full humanity of Jesus in these verses. I am becoming. He became anguished and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And he tells Peter, James, and John, you stay here and keep watch with me. Many of us know what it's like to have someone with us in crisis. You know, in the announcement, Randy was talking about the congregational care team trying to fill the shoes of Pastor Steve. You all, many of you know what it's like 
when you're sitting in that surgery waiting room just to have another human being with you. They don't have to talk to you. They don't have to do anything but sit next to you. And your grief and your anguish is shared. Somehow it's just shared. Now, that person may pray for you. They may embrace you. But the thing is, in those times, we want people with us. In those times, we want that burden to be shared by someone else because we can become crushed by grief. We can be crushed in our soul. Our spirit can be just heavy and burdensome. And when we know somebody is praying, when we see somebody physically and tangibly sitting next to us in that waiting room, somehow the burden is lightened. But understand what grief does to us physically. You know, our brother John Payne, he lost his wife Brenda early in the spring. John had been feeling poorly, didn't quite know what it was, so he went to one doctor and the doctor told him, uh, well, I think it's congestive heart failure. Well, that was pretty bad news that John didn't want to hear. But then he went to a specialist, a heart specialist, and you know what the heart specialist told him? He said, the only thing wrong with you is you're still grieving your wife. Physically, tangibly affected his health. His grief, his brokenness, his heavy hearted missing, mourning his wife had now affected him physically. And, and this is where Jesus is, the full humanity of Jesus. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Will you sit here and pray with me? Verse 38, or verse 39 rather, Jesus went a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground. Jesus wasn't leaning up on the rock doing this. His face was in the dirt of the garden. He bowed down with his face to the ground and he prayed, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering, he's calling this whole ordeal, the beatings, the whipping, the battering, the bruising, the bleeding, the cross. He's calling all of this the cup of suffering. Let this cup of suffering be taken from me. Now understand, theologically, it's just not the pain and the suffering that Jesus is asking to be removed. Theologically, what we're talking about here is Jesus is saying, do not let your wrath for the people's sin fall on me. Because Jesus understood the gravity. He understood the breath and the depth of God's wrath falling on him for the sake of all humanity. It's just not the physical pain. It's just not the nails in his hands and ankles. It's just not the spear in the side. It is God's wrath falling on the Son for the sins of the world. And Jesus says, Oh, Father, can we bypass this? It's the humanity of Jesus. That's what I would have said. And then Jesus says the most amazing words of which we should shout hallelujah to. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Isn't that what changed you and me forever? It's when Jesus said, let this cup pass from me, but if there's no other way, I want your will to be done. In God's will, was that a way would be made for humanity to come back to Him after Adam and Eve messed up everything in the garden. God's will was, a way, was for a way to be made for you and I to come back and embrace Him and engage Him in fellowship with Him and reestablish what was broken in the garden. And that could only be done through the work of Jesus on the cross. Thankfully, Jesus remained loyal to his Father's will. And church, make sure you know this. 
That was the choice Jesus made. Jesus wasn't some robot that was pre-programmed to die on the cross. Jesus volunteered for this mission. Jesus said, send me, I'll go. Because he was the only one that could possibly fulfill this mission. Verse 40, Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Three times Jesus went to pray, came back to the disciples and found them asleep. Three times Jesus poured out his heart. Three times Jesus was praying in deep anguish and grief. And three times he came back. And those who were supposed to support him and uphold him in prayer and be his strength in this time of weakness were sleeping. And then Jesus says, after the third time, get up, boys. Look at the gate of the garden. My betrayer is here. And so it begins, verse 47. And even as Jesus said this, my betrayer is here, one of the twelve, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, he arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords in clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. Isn't it ironic that they come for the Prince of Peace with clubs and swords? <laughs> they're, not, <laughs> they're not going after Charlie Manson. They're not going after David Koresh. They're not going after Jim Jones. They're going after the Prince of Peace. And they brought clubs and swords. Then Judas gave Jesus the infamous kiss of betrayal. And then they grabbed Jesus and arrested Him. And a scuffle broke out. And for some reason, Peter had a sword. He was a fisherman, remember? He had a sword and he swung it wildly and cut off a dude's ear. Jesus reached down, put the dude's ear back on. I always liked that flannel graph story in Sunday school, didn't you? <laughs> it was one of my favorites. Right after the bear mauled the children, remember that one? So, this scuffle breaks out and for some reader, Peter has a sword and, and they're like going to fight this physical fight. And, and here's the thing, church. We're not physical. We're, it's not a physical battle that we're fighting. It's a spiritual battle we're fighting. And we have to trust that whatever we need to fight this spiritual battle, Jesus is going to give it to us. He lays that out throughout the epistles in the New Testament. That we have this armor in Galatians and, 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 and we have the fruit of the Spirit and it's these things that we war against the evil one with. And somehow... Peter and the other disciples thought this was a fist fight. Look what Jesus says in verse 52. He says, put away your sword. Those who use the sword die by the sword. And you see, sometimes people think that this is like some kind of pacifist saying to Je that, that you know, Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you die for the sword. Therefore, I can't be in the military. That's, that's not what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying here is he's making this other point that has nothing to do with a physical battle. His point is this. Look at verse 53. Don't you realize that I could ask my Father for a thousand angels to protect us and He would send them instantly? See, in the garden we've seen the humanity of Jesus. And you know what we see in this verse? The divinity of Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. So Jesus says... Do you think I'm worried <clears throat> about a few strong-armed guys from the temple with, with, with clubs? I could look up to my father and wink my eye and annihilate every single one of them. Oh, yeah, it, you, you're fighting the wrong war, guys. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. Trust me in this. I could ask my father. 
for a thousand angels to appear, and he would send them instantly. Verse 56, but these things, all of these things in the garden, everything leading up, the betrayal of Judas, the garden, and this whole incident, but all of these things are happening to fulfill the words of the prophets. Isaiah 53 and in Zechariah 12 and 13, all of these things are foretold. But all of this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. And at this point, all of the disciples got around Jesus and protected him. Is that what your Bible says? No. At this point, they all ran like schoolgirls. They all ran away from the fight. Jesus said, don't worry about a thing. This is under control. This is simply what the scriptures foretold long ago. The disciples should have knew the scriptures. They were Jews. And they ran away. Like the bully had showed up. And they ran away before they could get picked on again. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. So, Jesus is left. He's on his own. The guards take him from the Garden of Gethsemane up into Jerusalem, took, him, took Jesus to the high priest's house. At this time, it's 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And the high priest, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, and the religious leaders, they had set up a courtroom. They were bringing Jesus in at this illegal trial because Roman law says that you must have trial in the daytime. It's the middle of the night. They've got this impromptu courtroom set up, and Jesus is already guilty. We know that before he even gets in the door. Verse 59. Inside the leading priests and the entire high council. Notice the phrasing. Inside the leading priests and entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. I hope the leadership of this church is a cut above that. This is the religious leaders of the Jewish nation were trying to find people who would lie about Jesus so they could kill him. The ninth commandment says, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And here the religious leaders were looking for a false witness. Verse 60, but even though they found many who agreed to give false witness. How many people are out at three in the morning? Although they found many people, I know what kind of people are out at three in the morning. And they're not anybody you want to believe. But even though they found many who agreed to give false witness, they would not use anyone's testimony. Finally, finally, two men came forward who declared, this man Jesus said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Now in John chapter 9, Jesus said something sort of, kind of like that. In John chapter 2 verse 19, Jesus in referring to his body said, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days, speaking prophetically about his crucifixion and his resurrection. But see, they misconstrued it, and that's all they needed. Because it's funny, in the first century, you could say a lot of stuff, but you couldn't talk bad about the temple. Don't talk bad about this building, or we'll throw you in jail. That's almost as silly as using a plastic straw, right? <laughs> yeah, don't use a plastic straw. Don't talk bad about the church building up at 1400 Numa. So, so, so Jesus had this false, misconstrued charge. He said bad things about the temple. Well, with very few words, Jesus is convicted. He's guilty of the crime of blasphemy. 
actually, when they, the only question they asked Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, they said, tell us if you're the Son of God. Tell us if you're the Messiah. And Jesus didn't really answer them other than turn it back on them. Tell us if you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, it is as you say. So Jesus didn't say he was the Messiah. He told them, it is as you say. You said it. Of course, we know it to be true. And then we know that the disciples, uh, the Pharisees got all up in a lather and they tore their robes and they were spitting and sputtering. They started punching Jesus and um, he was guilty. His fate was sealed. No further evidence was necessary. And then Peter falters. At the same time, Jesus is going through the mockery of this trial inside, outside in the courtyard. Verse 69. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. Since the time they had left the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, uh, Peter had been following Jesus at a distance. And so Peter was warming himself by the fire. Again, it's three in the morning. Where do these people come from? What are they doing? Anyway, there's a group of people around this fire in the courtyard. Jesus is inside at the mockery of this trial. Peter's trying to get warm. And two women and one man approach him. They challenge him on his relationship with Jesus. They say, hey, aren't you some way connected to Jesus, the guy in there that, uh, you know, they're trying to kill? Are oh, you connected to him, right? Oh, no, that's not me. Another person, hey, now I can tell by your accent that you're from Galilee. Now Jesus is from Galilee. Surely you must be connected to Jesus. Oh, no, no, no. In fact, one version, I don't know if it's, I think it's in, in the John passage, maybe Luke, says that Peter even cursed. This is how angry he got of being connected with Jesus, that he cursed. Verse 74 after Peter denied Jesus for the third time, immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, that you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter went away and he was weeping bitterly. He was weeping bitterly. Now when you compare Judas actions against Peter's actions. All Judas really did was showed him where Jesus was, right? All, all Judas did was, was, was he brought them to where Jesus was at. I didn't read that Judas denied Jesus. But here, Peter three times, he, he swore, I, I don't know him, I'm not connected to, with him. Well, you know, who's the worst person here? Peter by denying that he's even connected to Jesus? Or, or Judas just simply brought them to Jesus? I don't know. Just a little something for us to think about. But here's what we need to see about Judas and about Peter. Both of them failed Jesus, as did the other disciples when they scattered. One of the basic and most difficult lessons for us to learn in the Christian life is our inconsistency of faith. The hardest lesson you and I will ever learn is that we cannot be consistent in following Jesus. We'll do well for a season and then we'll stub our toe. We'll do well and be committed and then we bump into a wall. We'll do well and then a monkey wrench gets thrown. We, we need to understand we can't point fingers at Judas. We can't point fingers at, at Peter simply because we are them. But what we can celebrate is that every time we falter, that forgiveness is available through repentance. Every time we stub our toe, every time we, we, we mess up, forgiveness is available. Worship team, why don't you come up as we get ready to close? So now we go back to the upper room. Jesus is there with his disciples. This is Thursday evening, verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, that's Passover, that's Thursday, the disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal? 
Jesus says, go into town and prepare it at a friend's upper room. So verse 20, when evening came, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. During the meal in the upper room, Jesus identifies Judas as the betrayer and he leaves. During the course of the meal, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He models Christian humility and serves service and tells them to do likewise. But then what happens in the middle of this meal, and, and you have to be somebody important to do this. The Passover had been celebrated the exact same way for centuries. Ever since the Jews were rescued out of bondage in Egypt, the Passover meal had never changed. The Jews religiously, strictly kept this ordinance. You have the Passover meal and the bitter herbs and you have the lamb and you have the lamb bone and on and on and this whole symbolic meal to celebrate being freed from captivity in Egypt. And all of a sudden in the middle of this meal that has been done the same way for centuries, Jesus says, this bread... Now, from now on, this bread is special because this bread is my body. What? What are you doing, Jesus? You're changing the Passover. Who do you think you are changing the Passover? Well, I'm God in the flesh. Of course I can change the Passover, right? And then he says, oh, and by the way, the, the, this wine, every time you drink this wine, you remember me and my sacrifice because from now on, this wine is special. Verse 26 and as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat this. This is my body from now on. Everything that you know about the old covenant is changing. Everything you know about this Passover meal, the lamb that was slain every year for the temporary forgiveness of sin, no longer does that come into play. And he took the cup of wine. He gave thanks to God for it. And he said to them, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood. You see, Jesus was using these elements as visible, tangible reminders. Every time you eat and drink these things, you think of me, and you think of the cross, and you think of redemption, and you think about the Lamb of God that has forgiven the sins of the world once and for all. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and people. It's poured out as a sacrifice for the, to forgive the sins of many. Under the old covenant, as I said, a lamb had to be slain every year for the temporary forgiveness of sin. Now with Jesus, He is the Passover lamb. He is the holy lamb of God. No longer will you need the blood of lambs and sheep and goats and oxen. It's the blood of God Himself that will cover our sins. One time, and it's done for all eternity. Jesus was the final sacrifice. This was the last Passover that was ever needed. Now, rather than remember the old covenant through the Passover meal, we celebrate the new covenant through the meal of the bread and the cup. Jesus said in verse 29, Mark my words, pay attention, I will not drink wine with you again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is giving them some hope. Jesus is talking about His future reign. Jesus is talking about the glories of heaven. Jesus is talking about the marriage feast of the Lamb when you'll be there and I'll be there and Jesus will be there. And you know what? He's going to bust out the wine of heaven. Oh boy. That'll be a party you don't want to miss. 